Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. This is episode 304 for December 26th, 2022, the last episode of the year. And today we've got a really fun, interesting interview with uh, the CEO of a company called Safing. And they make a product called Portmaster, which is free. And they also make another very interesting product called a Safing Private Network. It's not really a VPN, it's an SPN. And the differences are important. But before we talk about the interview, uh, a couple quick things. You've got about five or six days, or maybe less, depending on when you listen to this. You've got until New Year's Eve. A stroke of midnight here on Eastern Time Zone in the United States. You've got until New Year's Eve to enter the big 300th episode giveaway. Uh, there will be five winners, one grand prize winner and four regular winners, who will take home about $2,000 worth of stuff. If you go to fdsd.me slash ep300, if you go to that link, you will get all the details about how to enter and pictures of all the prizes and all that good stuff. You've still got time to enter and you've got great chances of winning. Then there's many, many ways to enter. Also, for the rest of this month until the same time, until New Year's Eve, stroke of midnight, I've got the Dragon Coin Swag Pack giveaway for patrons new and old, as long as you sign up for an annual membership at the right level. To find out more about that one, go to fdsd.me slash coin promo. Or just go to Patreon and look for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. You'll find a post there near the top with all the details. And one more thing, the fifth edition of my book is available for pre-order. They have finally fixed the description. The formatting is not great, but at least they fixed the content. Working on fixing the formatting. But the price there is not the price that it's going to be. It's going to be lower than that. And the release date is not what's shown there either. It's going to be sooner than that. I don't know the exact price and I don't know the exact release date, but I know it will be cheaper and sooner than what's listed. It's a huge update to the book. I'm very proud with how this came out. A lot of great new tips. The previous version had like 170 tips, and this one's got over 200. All right, so for the interview. First of all, this interview does get a little technical, but hang in there. There's some really important insights, and there's a reason why we go through some of those details. Now, my interviews are never supposed to be infomercials, and so this is, you know, I tried not to make this about what they're doing, but turns out that what they're doing is not really being done elsewhere. If these are products that I, I think are really cool, extremely valuable, and take a very interesting new tack on privacy and like network discovery and things like that. So it's going to be kind of hard to avoid, but it's really cool stuff. And I really like what they're doing. So I think it's important and I think it's good to discuss because it's really, we've talked about VPNs many times on this show, but VPNs really aren't about privacy, despite being called a virtual private network. It's really a virtual secure network. The whole thing was security it really wasn't meant to be private. And the folks at Safing realized that limitation and decided they wanted to fix it. And I think they've got a really cool solution. So we're going to have to dig into what that means and how it works. So we're going to do that today in the interview. So real quick, a couple definitions. He talked about Zigbee. If you've never heard of this, this is a home automation wireless protocol that lets your IoT devices talk together and lets you configure them. Unfortunately, there are several standards, you know, which brings me to one of my favorite phrases. The nice thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. But there is hopefully going to be some consolidation on this matter. M-A-T-T-E-R is kind of a new spec. Apple's been supporting it. Google, I think, is going to support it. And it, hopefully we're going to get some of this home automation stuff standardized. So all these things will be able to work and talk together. Also, he talks about onion encryption. This is like the Tor network. This is where you've got multiple nodes and kind of your internet packets are kind of wrapped three different times with three different layers of encryption. It's, it's kind of hard to describe briefly, but that when he talks about onion routing, that's what he's talking about. But there's going to be some other technical stuff in here and it, don't worry too much. Don't get hung up on the fact that you don't know what we're talking about when we start talking about TCP and UDP and, and all that kind of stuff. Just listen for the important parts about how this, about the, the products they have will help you kind of discover what's going on in your system and who's talking to what and how we can do a better job of creating a product that does what most people think a VPN already does and doesn't. All right, so with that as our intro, let's get to our interview with Raphael from Safing. Raphael Fiedler is a CEO of Safing and a speaker on topics about privacy and regular co-host on an InfoSec podcast. Uh, welcome to the show, Raphael. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be on. We're going to talk about some of the stuff you guys have been working on. You've got an interesting product called Portmaster that's uh, kind of a, I would, I've called it a reverse firewall. That's not really the real name of the application firewall is probably the better term. 
and this other really cool thing called an SPN. So we're going to talk over around that today and why these things are so interesting. So tell me a little bit about safing and what you guys do. Yeah, sure, sure. And um, when you say like the reverse thing, I I looked up what other people are saying about application firewalls, and I agree. Many people looking at firewalls look at it from like the reverse, like how we sort of approach it. But Portmaster does do it from both sides, just to get it out of the to answer your question, like what safing is, I think I have a fun and I have a technical answer. All right. Um, let's start <laughs> let's start with the fun one. Um, I think safing is the natural counter reaction to advertisement tracker and surveillance apparatus. So it's sort of like what needed to happen to counteract that. The technical answer is yeah, safing develops privacy software designed to put users back in control over their data. So all we do is for that goal, and it's <laughs> with that in mind. So obviously, there's a lot of you know VPN companies out there and, and folks that do things like this. What what did you want to add to the conversation? What what was it you thought you needed to bring out to market that was not already there? I think uh, you already said it. Like the application firewall is something that's missing from the conversation. Um, you as a Mac user might have heard of Little Snitch. Um, and of course, for Mac, that's um, an interesting piece of software. It's sort of hard to use, and I guess it got easier over the years. But back in the day when I started using it and my wife got my laptop, she accepted everything. And so basically, it like removed the purpose of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Little Snitch um, did for the Mac, something like that wasn't, I guess, is still missing on Windows. There is Glasswire as an option, but Glasswire uses the Windows Firewall API and stuff like that. And there is Simple Wall out there uh, who also does great stuff. It's uh, and, and actually, like when we're talking here, I think what Safing tries to do is a little bit nuanced and is a little bit in between those other products. We felt like there is not one solution that uh, sort of like combines all the necessary bits and pieces to get a full privacy sort of like start where you can actually investigate your device, investigate what's going on, and then start to take actions with it. Uh, because Glassware tells you how much stuff is connecting, but you can only block uh, like applications as a whole. And uh, Simple Wall doesn't tell you most of the stuff, and it's only like also connection blocking and not um, going that much into depth. It, and what Portmaster tries to do is give you more details. Where is the connection going, countries? What protocols are they using and stuff like that? So I guess it's more detail. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, uh, we're already getting into some of the technical stuff, but we'll, we'll circle back to that after we've laid a little, little bit more groundwork. So let's back up and think about this at a higher level. What are the most likely threats to security and privacy today for regular people from a networking perspective? A lot of times we think of viruses and things like that, but from a networking perspective, which is the kind of products where we talk about today, what, what sort of, like, what sort of questions should, we, should I be asking myself to try to understand what like my personal networking threat model is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course you talk about this on your podcast as well. I, I think last week you had the gift guide and of course the gift guide mentioned like that IoT devices are, you should be wary of what to buy. And I don't know if your uh, listeners know that, but actually the S in IoT stands for security. Um, <laughs> I said so, that many times myself. Yes. Okay. Well then <laughs> I haven't heard that in that episode. So I wasn't sure if, if people are familiar with that, but I'm um, like, I would say, look at your router, look at what connections are on your network and have like, just if there is device, you don't know if there is something going on there that you like don't understand where it's coming from. And I get, I guess more and more people, especially now are getting maybe Roombas and you said it as well, like Amazon is buying Roomba at the moment. Mm -hmm. But if you're getting something um, from a different vendor as well, it's like this device um, has an active internet connection outside, can pull updates. It might have microphones without you even knowing that they're in there. They like, if they don't tell you, you would not, right. you would not know to look for a microphone on your robot, uh, like vacuum robot and stuff. Right. And so I'd say from a, from a personal perspective, networking, I think it got much harder. And I think that the router firewall that most like ISP routers ship with this like layer of protection can basically be considered breached at this point for most people, if they have not like investigated every product they connect into their network, you can start thinking about your home LAN as hostile uh, territory. And you should sort of like go 
even for like deeper. And this is partly the reason why we're developing an application firewall as a software as well, so that you can actually like protect your device in the network. Right. It's like, it's kind of like the classic uh, horror movie trope of, you know, the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> Right. I mean, you, you've now invited into your home all of these connected devices, these quote unquote smart things that have their mind of their own. I mean, and could be compromised or could just be mining your data for for various reasons. And that's why I always think of it as a reverse firewall, firewall because most firewalls you think of protecting things from getting in from the outside that you, you don't want to penetrate your network. But nowadays we've invited all these things into our network already that are phoning home and who knows what kind of information they're they're sending. Right. Yeah. And of course, you're right. It's like it's uh, hardware, of course, and it does not even have to be malicious from the get go. But how long is your light bulb being supported with security updates? Mm -hmm. How long? And and are you like aware of this? Would you update like your smart light bulb? And how would you know that there is an update and stuff like that? So I guess this is just it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when. So if you start smarting up your home, you should have a plan up front. I do have smart lights. I use home uh, like home assistant for that. I have mm -hmm. my own server at home and update everything. And I try not to buy any smart things which connect to Wi-Fi so that they're all on Zigbee and sort of like therefore in a different network. <laughs> well, and that's something I've talked about recently on the show too, that, that a couple of things actually that worry me when I think about these things is, you know, first of all, I, I recommend that most people put their IoT devices on their guest network. So at least it's yeah. segregated in that regard from, from the rest of your stuff on your network. But the other thing I'm worried about now too is one of two things. First of all, with IPv6, one of the reasons we have routers is this NAT capability, this network address translation, because there's not enough IP addresses to go around, which turns out to be a nice security feature. It's, so, it's security by obscurity, but your IP addresses in the house are not routable outside your house. But IPv6 addresses, we have so many of them that there's no really need to do NAT anymore. So I'm worried that some routers might just start exposing those things directly to the internet. And now I've lost control of that little function as well. So so would you recommend like disabling IPv6 on your router? I did. I don't know if that has the the effect I'm looking for, but I, it seems like that should do it. So so for that reason, I I have disabled and I recommend other people disable IPv6 because you don't need IPv6 inside your home. You know, you've yep. got, I mean, I've, I had a contest actually with some of my, my tech buddies and I'm like, okay, go look at your router right now. How many connections do you have? How many devices do you have on your home network? And I won, and which is, I don't know if that's a good thing, but I had, I had 40 or 50. I mean, different devices in my home that all had IP addresses handed up by my router. So that, you know, that's, that's a lot of places for something to go wrong. Yeah. And like with software, like you keep talking about, like software on your device can get outdated. You need to mm -hmm. be aware of it. And of course it's with hardware, the same thing, but with software, you at least are in the same place as the software. Usually right. you don't forget about software as easy as like the smart light bulb in like <laughs> the back of the house in the garage <laughs> where you never right. look at it and it just like it works and you start thinking about it as, so as soon as it does not work and i actually had a friend who like bought smart light bulbs very cheap and they started flickering and i looked at his network activity and i guess those light bulbs were part of a bot network at some point oh. so he got breached yeah and of course and in that regard i thankfully had the portmaster installed so i thought <laughs> i told him you, you, all incoming connections are blocked by default. Uh, if you have not tampered with this, they they were blocked from gaining access to your device. But as soon as you have a foothold inside a network, you can start probing around. And even though those smart light bulbs are weak in processing power, they have all the time of the world. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is rushing them. <laughs> so. Right. And you're not going to notice it. it like unless they had started flickering. If they had never started flickering, he would never have known, right? <laughs> no, he wouldn't. <laughs> so, all right, so we've, let's talk about the application firewall. What we're talking about there is the case where you've got so many apps on your device, on your phone, in this case, but I, we think about our phone apps, but you've got, you've also got apps on your computer and these things often start in the background automatically. Sometimes at startup, if you, you know, if you click that box and someone's like, you know, would you like to start a startup? Uh, or sometimes your computer just restarts the things that were running last time you restarted, right? So, and as long as these things are running or, or potentially background tax, they could be phoning home. They could be sending information. A lot of them will do telemetry. A lot of them are checking for updates, which is great, but sometimes they're doing more than that. So <laughs> I assume that that is, that is kind of why you've got 
this board master thing that has helped you to look at these things. Tell me some war stories. What are some, what were some of the things that you found some applications behaving badly that may, led you believe that we needed to have this tool? <laughs> I mean, it, it's sort of like it started back in the day when the snow and leaks happened. So this was when we started off thinking, okay, we need to start understanding better what actually is going on on our devices. Um, maybe to clarify this as well, you said mobile. Uh, Portmaster is on Windows right. and on Linux. Yeah. It's not on mobile yet. Android is the next operating system, mm. but it it will take a little bit more time. Yeah, we like I wanted to do iOS as well, but yeah, we can go into that later. Mm. So I think that for one, uh, when we think about the internet, when we think about connecting to the internet, most people think about the browser. And um, you already said like all those other connections, all those other applications in the back, but. Basically, what I needed was a an, an way to block Facebook out of Spotify and to make sure, because when they started, they had this login with Facebook and everybody like was able to stream what they're listening to to Facebook. And I'm like, I'm not just like, I don't trust Spotify enough to just disable this. I want to make sure it's not phoning to Facebook. Right. But on the other hand, back in that days, I still was using Facebook. So I could not block Facebook like on something like a pie hole or something like Right. on my firewall because I still wanted to use Facebook. So I needed a way to distinguish what is Spotify trying to connect to Facebook and what is my browser who tries mm. to connect to Facebook. And I wanted to distinguish those two. Now I'm like, I'm a privacy guy. I don't use Facebook anymore. Like account is deleted for years now, but <laughs> gotcha. back in the day, this was the use case. And I think it's still a thing. Like it, when you look at software that you're not sure about. And even if you check the the checksums before installation, sometimes um, new software comes with interesting connections and you want to be aware of them and you want to start blocking them. And Google Analytics comes shipped with a lot of software. So mm. we can just block this out for everything, not just the browser. Well, go back to the kind of the VPN thing. When we're out and about and we're on public Wi-Fi and we're making connections, it used to be a really big deal to protect those connections because back in the day they weren't all encrypted. HTTPS was not that common because until Let's Encrypt came around, it was expensive. People had to buy their certificates and most people were like, eh, why, you know, I'm not going to spend money for that. Why, why bother? Uh, but now that Let's Encrypt makes it free, much, much more. I think I read somewhere well over 90% of most common internet connections today are encrypted with HTTPS. Given that, has the need for using a VPN on public Wi-Fi changed? Do I need to worry about that as much? Yeah, good question. I say, like, from our perspective, part of the reason why we developed the Portmaster is that the Portmaster is free and you can always install it and um, block any connections which are not HTTPS. So you can sort of set rules and say, like, I'm outside. I don't want non-HTTPS connection to be established. And I think there is a need, like you're right, I, I heard this number as well, but as far as I can tell, it's for websites. Usually people mm. track are tracking websites and you don't know what like updates service, is this an mm. encrypted like update? And it's, as we said earlier with the devices, it's the same with your like, with your computer as well. One connection needs to be like unencrypted and you can inject something. I mean, it of course depends. The browser is more complex. You can inject mm -hmm. more stuff into a browser, but theoretically every connection that's not encrypted is a connection that can potentially be a foothold into your device. And from there, the person just can go deeper and duck himself into, into what you're doing. And I guess the other thing is there are still men in the middle attacks. I, I'm not that scared of those either. But of course, man in the middle East attacks with SSL stripping still is a thing. And uh, it's the same case here. Like, yes, if you have HTTPS anywhere and stuff like that, which forces your browser, should force your browser to only do HTTPS connections. Some websites just like, sometimes you can sneak in and it only needs to be one. And so this is still an issue where I'm like, yeah, where VPN still is useful. Like I, of course, we're like doing a competitive product to a VPN, mm -hmm. but for those people and for security and for people who are like working remote and in an internet cafe, uh, I think you should use a VPN. <laughs> right. All right. So here's a, here's a tricky question for you. You're a privacy guy. Yeah. This is a privacy product. Do you make privacy products? I am too. But you now, because you have a, something like Porkmaster and you have your SPN, which we're going to talk about, you are in a position to get a lot of interesting crowdsourced data. 
the, the natural question I wanted to ask you was, well, you've got a product that does this. How, how many connections, outbound connections from applications other than your web browser turned out not to be encrypted? Because you would be in a position to record, at least statistically, if not, you know, because you, you could do this in a way that would not invade someone's privacy. In your own testing, at least, do you have any data on, well, you know, your browser, yes, almost everything connect, is connected, but most software applications check for updates over non-encrypted channels or something like that. What have you found? Uh, good question. I have not looked into this. First off, just to let you know as well, Portmaster does not send any data. We do automatic updates every hour just to update filter lists, KYP databases and stuff like that. But you can disable this and Portmaster is not phoning home anything. I could not even tell you how many people are using the Portmaster right now. Like uh, I just, uh-huh. we see GitHub stars. This is always a projection like they have started going up quite a lot uh, recently, but we also put a GitHub button now on our homepage. So maybe there's a correlation <laughs> there, but <laughs> I could not tell you. Like statistically, we we are thinking of maybe doing user surveys and uh, asking voluntarily if people want to share something with us. But so far, we there it is a slippery slope as soon yeah. as you start sending data. And I know you talked about this as well. Sometimes having some insight into how your software is performing, how many clicks people are doing regularly. I would love this. Uh, like uh, at some, uh, always like our software is fairly complicated at the moment. We want to make it easier. And it's it's always difficult to ask people like, what would you improve? And they're like, I already know how to do it. So <laughs> yes, I, and, I can't tell you anymore. Well, and I struggle with this too. In fact, I we're going to get off a little bit of a tangent here, but analytics is something that are really really, really helpful for people like us that, are, that create products that are being used by customers. And without having to bug them with a survey, analytics automatically gives us some really useful statistics on how our products are used, how often they're used, when they're used. You know, that's it's very helpful information. And and it's so useful. It's so built into everything. Like I've got a mailing list and, and it, I run that through a company because it's a lot easier to have, you know, a company run that. But by default, this company throws analytics into every one of my newsletters. I didn't put it there. And I had, I actually had one of my readers reach out to say, Hey, you've got analytics links on all your stuff. And I'm like, well, okay, yes, you're right. I didn't put them there, but they're there. And I can't not put them there. Like the company I use because they want to tell me how many people clicked on links that were in my episode or in my newsletters. And I'd like to get that. So my my response basically was, I do this for me. I don't, there's no personal information. You are absolutely within your right to not click those links or to block those analytics. I, I support that as a privacy person, I must. And so that's, that is the trade-off. That is the, that is the war we fight with ourselves when it comes to these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I so agree. Like analytics, I, talked about this on on reddit a couple of days ago about logging and people were like oh logging is bad and like it all depends on what you log like even just logging how often like you ping something this could be a log but like how much it does not mean that there is personal and identifiable information associated with this logging and on the other hand of course you can sort of like walk back and have a lot of non-personal identifiable information gain a lot of information so this is basically we we sort of like actually don't want to think about this like or how we deal with that data and i think you talked about this in the nord episode like toxic waste um stuff we push away from us and it's true this is absolutely what we do as well it's how we handle actually like signing into spn as well and stuff like this where we are always thinking about what do we need to send and how can we sort of protect the user in that regard as well to to send as little as possible? And yeah, but we can go into that later also. All right. So let's talk a little bit about VPNs. And, and that's going to lead into something you called an SPN, which is a really interesting concept. So let's, but let's talk about standard vanilla VPNs that most people are familiar with today. So they're, they're, they're marketed today as like a silver bullet. They, they solve all your security and privacy problems. But what what actually can a VPN do for me? And which of these marketing claims are just totally bogus? <laughs> I think that they actually dialed that back a bit. I think they got called out and mm. caught on promises they were not able to keep mm. for like way too often. And I think they are dialing that back now. Like As well, I they should. At, yeah, they should. They should, yeah. <laughs> and I think the main reason is the disconnect about what VPNs were built to do and what they are trying to do with them. And I sort of, like have thought about an anecdote how to to put this and as little like how to think about it is that 
you have like a technology that's used to build something and even how they're like putting it together is similar, but the use case is very different. Mm. So let's say you have three brushes, a paintbrush, a hairbrush, and a toothbrush. And they're all the same, like in the same ballpark of technology. It's all like bristles on a stick, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. but you would never brush your teeth with a paintbrush. That's just like it, from the mm. sound of it, it's just yikes. You, you would never <laughs> do something like that. So, and in that regard, I'm like, yes, what, what Tor does, what uh, Apple with private relay does and what VPNs do, you can say tunneling to most of those things. And what the SPN does is we talk about tunneling as well, but how like VPNs are built, it's for security. And sometimes, especially for instance, um, I know you talked about WireGuard a bit as well. And I think WireGuard is a great bro- protocol for security, but what they do, basically what they have is an authentication that both that the, the server you connect to and you authenticate against each other with like a public private key pair on both sides, you know? And so, and this is for, great for security. You want to know that the person you're letting into your network, which basically a VPN allows, mm-hmm. is the person who actually says he is. Mm. But of course, for privacy, this is very contrary. Like, you don't want to, like, uh, if you want to sell a VPN for privacy, you want the server to not know who the person is who's connecting. Right. And so privacy companies have to sort of build around this, those fundamental protocols, which are built for a very different purpose. They're building for like painting a wall and they're trying to brush, like jam them into your mouth and be like, you brush your teeth with this. And I think like, this is just not, it's just not suited for it. So we thought about how we could do this different, but yeah, I think there is a place for VPNs uh, just to make this sure as well. I, I know you said like bogus claims, they're great for watching like movies in a different country. And I think that's what they're currently marketing more Mm. Uh, and I think that's great, but it's not privacy. That like they can know what Netflix show you're watching, right, and stuff like that. And I think it's also okay if you don't trust like the public Wi-Fi where you're at, and you trust your VPN more. Then like go for it. And if you really don't trust your ISP, first off, why are you still like with that ISP? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you don't have another option, then of course you can like move your trust to the VPN, but it is a lot of trust you put into them. They can see everything. And if you don't think like they would do it, you also have to think about where the like the server, what which you're connecting to is located. Of course, this data center who like has the internet cables coming in and out, they see the traffic and they can do traffic analysis and they see your real IP on the encrypted traffic and they see the Tar- like the the outgoing IP on the unencrypted traffic, and they can do traffic matching and stuff like that. And um, this is also, of course, the case if a server is hacked, and they can have everything in RAM as much as they want, and delete everything on REST. If somebody's observing your server, and it's one location, stuff coming in, coming out, and the the traffic is not mixed, or like you see identifiable like data sizes, stuff like pictures or something, usually have a very unique size, you can match this. And then you can start working your way back. You always need one foothold and you can start working your way back to who is this person actually and stuff like that. So I think this is a little bit bogus. It, it is a tool and it has this use case, but privacy is not one of them. Right. I mean, the, the original use for VPN, it, at least in my experience, was to connect travel warriors at, at work and people who worked at a big corporation and they need to get to the corporate network while they're traveling. So they're outside the corporate network's bounds or off campus and they're traveling on, for whatever reason, going to sales meetings or going to a conference and they need to get back home. And so this was created, this secure tunnel between wherever they are, whatever internet access point they're, they have to be using, whatever Wi-Fi hotspot or at home or whatever, and they could get into the corporate network and that was a secure tunnel. And that was the only reason for it. And then along the way, we came up with these other kind of consumer uses for VPNs like, you know, reaching traffic outside when you're traveling abroad and you want to get to your U.S. Netflix account or, and somehow we, we thought this was privacy, uh, <laughs> but it, when you're like, exactly what you said, I tried to tell people you're, all you're doing is you're shifting your trust from your current ISP, which might be a Wi-Fi hotspot provider. It might be the airport or the hotel or the coffee shop or your ISP, your, the one you're used to, or your mobile ISP for the VPN. And because now they can see everything you're doing, right? So yeah, that's okay. But now I want to talk about this new thing called decentralized VPNs. And this is (laughs) all the buzzwords because 
<laughs> I, I I love the the classic flow diagram that. And I'll see if I can't find this. I'll put a link to it. it. But it's simple. I can describe it. And the flow diagram is a choice point. It says, do I need to use blockchain? And, you know, and, and the, both answers go to no. I mean, there's, the answer is always no. You don't, you don't have to use blockchain. There's very few things other than maybe cryptocurrency, right? Because everyone wants to throw blockchain at something. But so these decentralized VPNs, to explain to the audience, what is the, not yours, but these other concepts of decentralized VPNs and why in the heck they throw blockchain at them? <laughs> I think they threw blockchain at them to make it easier to sort of like pay people in that regard. It's oh sure because like what you're trying to do is um, sell sort of your own bandwidth, sell your home data, and sort of like connect in that way. And I think it's and you talked, I think you talked about this as well. But there is an, a video, a recent one from Naomi. Um, yes, I don't think I mentioned it on the show, but it's a, I put the show links. That's great. Okay. Yeah. No. And it's talking about like VPN aggregation and how yes. many like how how many VPNs are owned by the same company, and sort of like I would call it big VPN, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, what they're like doing is to go against that and um, to have smaller like you you sell basically like what some people do with cryptocurrencies as well. You sell your small like piece of internet bandwidth to somebody else and so for this of course you need to sort of like be like rewarded or stuff mm -hmm. like this this is of course an incentive and i think it's it's an interesting idea but what most of them of course are not uh, talking about is attribution like basically um when you pay somebody for the bandwidth you're using on the blockchain there's a permanent record of that usage you used their bandwidth on the blockchain you, and this is traceable back this is like uh, and so as soon as somebody figures out what's your wallet they can walk back and understand where you connected to from what places and stuff like that and so i feel like it's an it's an interesting idea but very half-baked at the moment and maybe it will develop i'm not sure if blockchain will still be part of it but i see i like i see a value in it and we actually, <laughs> and you, I think you're going to hate me for this. Um, we actually thought about in a more privacy respecting way, but distribute, of course, like how much data one of our nodes is handling and keeping track of that, but only on the node level through blockchain as well. You only pay the first node and then, but we talk about how the SPN works later, but then through the network, it would start paying each node for the, for the traffic it would handle. Huh. And so this would be like a wave going through. We have not tested it yet and we are a flat rate model. So we avoid this by being a flat rate model, but we are thinking about doing it, test it if this would be viable. But yeah, so I have this dream about a post advertisement future. And for this, I think blockchain actually like paying as you go in small mm. pieces can be a privacy respecting option. So. Interesting. Yeah, that, that's like kind of the micro payment thing that we've talked about for many years with uh, you know visiting websites. It's never quite materialized unless you create the brave attention token thing. Okay, so but let's back all the way up because for so the, the the point of the decentralized VPN is that there's not well, actually maybe you can explain this. I'm understanding is that it's trying to not have a central set of nodes that are known, for example, like a lot of trouble with yeah. people have with VPNs is that once you go with a particular provider, they own a certain set of IP addresses that are well known. And so Netflix might block those. Uh, so decentralizes some sort of this mesh VPN thing, right? So what back up a little bit, explain why that would be an important, interesting feature to a VPN. Yeah, and, and you're right. This is the second thing, of course, as well, not just the, that you don't trust big VPN, but also, of course, as you said, from a user perspective, that you have more access to to um, domestic IP addresses. Uh, you're absolutely correct on that. And this is actually an issue we have with our network as well. Like every server that you have, which hundreds of people connect to at one point, they figure out, well, this server who the hundredth person connected to our service probably is sort of something like a VPN, even though like, uh, yeah, mm. we are not, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like it. And mm. yeah, domestic IP addresses, they change more often. Like a uh, router usually gets a new one as soon as you restart it. And this is why they're valuable. And so gaining access to domestic IP addresses, yeah, you're right, um, allows you typically to connect to, to Netflix 
like without any hassles and they would not t they usually would not block a domestic ip address like and allocate it for domestic because it changes and so mm -hmm. If they block it, they don't know who they hit mm -hmm. tomorrow or the day after and stuff. So those are usually protected. And um, yeah, there are, there are absolutely is a use case for those types of things as well. Yeah, but it, you're right. The way they're implemented just is is not fleshed out yet. So <laughs> I would strongly recommend anybody to not use a DVPN or have a good look at it beforehand <laughs> and think about how they attribute stuff. And so that, that leads us directly to your SPN. So you've got a, something you call a safing private network. And how how is it different from a VPN or even a decentralized VPN? How does it work and what problems is it solving? <laughs> what problem is it solving? So um, yeah, we're, we talked about earlier like that I don't like see a VPN being designed for like on a protocol level n is not designed for privacy. Um, you're actually connecting to networks. Like they actually have to put effort into on the server to not have other people who are on the same server to access your network. Mm -hmm. Because of course, theoretically, it, that that server is the central hub for all those people, mm -hmm. and they're all on the same network now, theoretically. And so they they actually need to put some effort in there. So what we're doing is is basically going a step further and thinking about how should we do it with a more privacy respecting way and what typically like from an OC level level perspective VPNs do is create a level three network all right i gotta stop Wired. you right there my audience has no idea what the osi stack is so take take, take us back a second and explain okay. what the osi layers the osi stack is <laughs> I'm not prepared for it. <laughs> just just it. at a high level. I mean, okay, on a high level, it's talking about like you have your wires, and then you have your your electricity going through the wires, and then you start having protocols uh, like starting to layer onto that. And layer three is the um, first layer where you actually have like logic in there as well, and it's the network layer uh, as far so, yeah. as I can tell. Yeah. And the layer four is the protocol layer afterwards. And then layer five and above is application. So layer three, as I said, is it's a network layer. And so it's not the protocol layer. It's, it is not aware if it's TCP, UDP, or whatever. It's just on a network level. And so typically, a VPN does not care uh, about what's going on on top of it. It's just redirecting everything. And so, um, of course, from filter perspective, what some VPNs start now to sell, they would have to do this either before or after they have to scan your traffic and stuff like that to, to actually do that, especially like if they're doing it on a server. And what we're doing is we're not taking stuff on the layer three, we're doing it on layer five. We're sort of like also like blocking everything on layer four. So on the protocol level, and we are taking, like we integrate it into the network stack and we're taking every application that tries to do a connection and sort of like repackage it. Um, we split bigger packages into smaller ones. We pad them as well so that they're all the same size. Mm. And then we onion encrypt them three times. Um, or like you can actually decide how often. Mm. <laughs> like we also have a, something we call the VPN mode, but that's not for privacy people. That's for people who want to have the speeds. Okay. Um, but <laughs> so that that would of course be from a privacy perspective the same as a VPN, only mm -hmm. one node. But typically on in layer encryption, you have multiple layers, and then the portmaster because uh, the portmaster knows how the network looks like those packages throughout the network. And they don't have to follow the same path. You can have multiple paths through the network because the exit node then starts putting those connections into an OSI level four connection, an actual TCP, UDP, whatever connection. And then this exit node actually starts talking to the server. So the exit node does not know anymore who you are, it just knows it should create a TCP connection to that server uh, and then what we're actually doing is we're like multiplexing the, the traffic as well, which also has other great applications because how we do it, we can do multiple paths through the network and it does mm. not have to be one. And I think this is very like much different to what Tor or Private Relay or any VPN of course is doing as well. They're all thinking of the traffic in one like route. Hmm. You have one server after the other, but what the SPN can do is like split it out as well. Hmm and have it go to 
it's it's three notes, like three hops, but it's with four notes. So two notes maybe in the middle or something like that. Huh. And so um, this actually splits it. And the reason why we're doing it is uh, partly because we <laughs> took the hot six story from Gordon Wellmans, Welkmans, mm, okay. Gordon Wellmans, hot six story. And it's talking about how to protect against traffic analysis. So what I was earlier talking about VPNs, that they are like, that you could uh, look at the server and sort of like walk back where was the encrypted stream coming in and where is the unencrypted going out and you sort of like do pattern matching on packet sizes and stuff like that. We saw that we want to build a network that's like protected against stuff like this because when we think about ISPs, we typically think about like the like lowest ISPs, the ones which we actually connect to and you mm -hmm. set it yourself, like it's the right. public Wi-Fi and stuff, mm -hmm. but you have higher grade ISPs above them as well. And of course, you don't pay them anymore and they right. are doing lots of data aggregation as well. And they can actually see the traffic coming in, coming out and stuff like that. And so to protect against those and against those, this pattern matching also on a, on a node level, this is why we started implementing stuff like this, where we are like, not just routing, like moving your data around for the sake of moving the data around, but splitting your data and sort of like distributing it and stuff. Interesting. <laughs> distributing it, yeah. <laughs> all right, so that immediately brought a couple things to mind. So uh, first of all, simple question, who owns these exit, exit nodes? Is it a decentralized thing where my client is actually routing some other people's stuff or do you actually own and operate the, the, the exit nodes? So nobody who's installing the Portmaster has to fear that they are now a node. Nobody is like, we, we make it fairly, I want to make it easier. We want to put out a Docker image for hosting a community node. Hmm. But uh, at the moment, we have three trust levels. We have saving nodes, and we have community nodes, and then we have trusted nodes in between. And uh, the user actually can look on the saving map, like in the Portmaster, and have a look what nodes are there, who's like, who owns them, who operates them, which data center are they in and stuff like that. And we want to give as much information to the user as they want, as they, as we can. And I think they need it because maybe they don't trust, like for instance, proxy store wants to do a node. Uh, they're in Germany. Great, great idea. You can sort of order through them and to their place, Amazon packages. So you don't have to order from Amazon yourself. <laughs> gotcha. And so, yeah. And so they are doing a community as well. This privacy effort and um, we're talking to Applied Privacy. Uh, they apply a foundation for Applied Privacy there in Vienna. And we'd love to have more people who are currently doing Tor notes, uh, maybe doing SP notes as well. And to those who talk to us, we can compensate them. We have a contract with them uh, saying for uptime and and bandwidth and stuff like that, they they get a fixed amount of money. This is what we're currently doing. We want, as I said, in the far future, maybe have this automated with blockchain, but it will it, and always will um, be servers and not clients. And it will not, uh, it will be like removed from the whole, like, where am I connecting to uh, situation? Like we would investigate this a lot because <laughs> it's not, we don't want to put blockchain in there just to have the name in. <laughs> But if it's a, if the technology fits, if it actually like facilitates stuff like that, like private payment off bandwidth and then like redistributing it to the people who are actually like serving you their bandwidth, this is what we're talking about. And this is what we're thinking about. So, yeah, did this answer your question? <laughs> yeah. And so that, that brings up my next question. And, and, and I didn't think about this until you, you were explaining it, but I, for people who really do care to back up what you're talking about, you, you talk about ISPs of ISPs. So there's, there's these yeah. other companies like layer three and the old days like MCI and WorldCom. These were the, the, the backbone providers for a lot of these other ISPs so that, you know, they're like, you're, it's your ISPs, ISP, and maybe even yeah. there, right. So these, these tiers, these layers, and in some of these companies, there's only a few of them. There's only, they're big enough that they have a visibility into a broad swath and like cloud cloud is another right of these cdn networks they, they have a, a broad visibility into internet traffic everywhere that gives them the really interesting capability of of kind of monitoring how the internet's doing they've got some really cool tools that you can look and see when whole countries go offline for example but it also means for somebody who's really really worried about privacy that if i can correlate enough of that data then i could start like you're saying and kind of walk back and figure out where all these packets are come from. So this leads to my question. Do you actually have in your, in your setup, a way for you to, to make sure that the three nodes chosen 
are from different backbone providers <laughs> or do you not you know what i mean like is that something you could even do yeah we we built our own like map of the networks on the internet we started doing the same thing like looking through um doing analysis of the internet and we built a world map of those networks and networks of networks and so we want to give this information to the customer as well so that like currently we do not like have this in there because we're not sure how to like explain this mm -hmm. as well like and and you're absolutely like talking about this i think many people don't know this um those like isps of isps of isps and it's i think a fairly difficult topic and so we're always um thinking about that what um functionality we can offer and what do we automate just because uh in the end of course the the biggest privacy risk is the user himself or herself sure. you know because it's <laughs> you, nobody's forcing you to put pictures on facebook nobody is forcing <laughs> you to do tiktok dances um that's all that's all on you <laughs> right <laughs> you're you're putting your face out there or your voice in our cases you know that's all on us and uh, so we are our own biggest privacy risk so we're sort of like thinking of how to display it very carefully before we are shipping something like that. But yes, we we are doing this. And theoretically, because we were talking about multiplexing uh, earlier as well, what we could do, this is sort of like one of my pet features, which I want to see, but it's not shipped in the Portmaster yet, is you could utilize a 4G, 5G connection um, next to your Wi-Fi mm -hmm. or like your Ethernet. And so your, your packages would start splits from the source. Um, oh, wow. So not sure. even the ISP would see what, what sort of stuff is coming in. I mean, oh, we're wow. repackaging it anyway and splitting it up already. So they do not see this picture coming in as one single package. It would be split up. And as I said, padded and stuff like this. So that this is already protected, but like with this, you could even have two ISPs. Maybe get yourself a Starlink dish, put it in the back and then right. <laughs> have your regular oh, that's ISP interesting. in the front. So in, yeah. in, in uh, I don't get to this, the podcast much, but in the book, I, I had, had this whole section of the book, this whole chapter on how the internet works. When I talk about how packets are broken down and how they're, and the, the analogy I use is, okay, let's say I want to mail somebody a copy of a dictionary, but I need to do it one page at a time. So how, would, how might I do that? Well, I could take every page out, rip it out and put it in its own envelope and send them. And because the pages are numbered, I could send them in any order. And what you're saying is I could actually use multiple services. I could use post office for one, FedEx for another, and UPS for another, and carrier pigeon for the others for all for all that matters. But as long as they all got to the end, they could take them all apart, look at all the page numbers and reassemble them into the book, right? Uh, yeah. So that that's really interesting that you're talking about that. Huh, that, that's cool. And this is like what we're doing, and but we're still focusing on speed. There are others out there, and uh, I don't know if you NIM or something like that, they're doing mixed net stuff. And this is different. They're doing like they're holding mails on purpose back in your analogy. Like they're holding them back. They're sending them in different orders and stuff. We're not doing this because what NIM is doing is basically like reducing speed mm -hmm. uh, for privacy. Like mm -hmm. this is only usable for stuff like that does not need to be fast. But what we want to do is give um, speeds that are like usable so that you can actually browse and surf the web and have a, a video call and stuff like this um, without any interruptions and without any additional delay. Well, and that's it all comes down to your threat model and all comes down to what problem you're trying to solve, right? And what you, you've got it there, you got to optimize for one for the other. There's always trade offs. So, yeah, it's really interesting to hear the how you guys chose which way you wanted to go. So, I want to circle back to something else you mentioned. And, it's, and, we often, again, even with, even with an SPN, there's nothing preventing you from giving yourself away. You know, when you're, if you used an SPN to go to Facebook, there's no privacy there. You're logged into Facebook. They know everything they're going to know because you're, it's first party communication, whatever you do with them, they're going to know. Right. So, uh, but there's other things that we do that we don't know that we're doing. For example, our browsers are fingerprintable because our browsers give up in these HTTP header responses, all this bounty of information about our systems that can be used to fingerprint us. And to be clear, I mean, again, this is the kind of thing where this is, it's a whole different layer. Your SBN has, and Portmaster has nothing to do with any of that, correct? Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we cannot do anything in the fingerprinting perspective. We're in contact with a couple of people, somebody who's actually wanting to 
build a new browser. He reached out, uh, but we're also sort of in contact with Brave. I, I uh-huh. don't want anybody calling me in regards to this, but <laughs> <laughs> they they reached out years ago when we were very oh, wow. early. So it's an old contact. I don't even know if that guy still works at Brave. But of course, and, and Signal has recently reached out to us. Um, oh, so neat. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the S Pin technology lends itself very well to stuff like this. And we'd love to to have it adopted into more into more stuff. So no, we're not building a browser, even though this sometimes is a question we are getting asked. But I mean, we're not even at this point doing our own like user interface. Like, yes, it's we are building it, but it's an electron. It's an electron mm-hmm. like viewing, like the UI is right. displayed in electron. Because it's easier. We're on sure. we're on so many Linux things and we're on Windows. And so like we want to get the technology right. We want to get the UI right. And then we're gonna of course it's an we want to build our own UI and uh, native to all those different platforms. But at the moment we're taking like we're focusing on a technology that our routing is correct, that the servers actually like do what they are doing and optimizing for speed, optimizing for privacy, optimizing <laughs> for sort of like not using that much data. Our our brain energy flows into how can we make like authenticate without uh, the authorization, like having this split so that people can actually use the SPN without telling anybody that they who they are, you know, and and stuff like this. And I think we have a fairly okay model for this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let me ask you one more kind of technical type question, and then we're going to start wrap things up a little bit. So sure. I've been trying to use VPNs more myself, and I've even just using it f- from home, and I'd like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be 100% VPN all the time. I, I, I find problems with it. Like I, I go to some websites and I get captures a lot more because it's, Hey, this is not where you normally come from. This looks kind of weird. And and they've got these, you know, some anti-fraud things, especially if I'm going to financial sites, they're like, uh, you know, I need to send you a code because I don't, I don't know where you're coming from. You know, I know you're in North Carolina, but for some reason you're coming up in Atlanta, you know, or something like that, which is nearby. It's, it's my VPN picked a, a nearby node, but it's not even in my state. Right. So it looks weird to them. I would have to think, that, that the way SPN works, where every single connection I'm creating, and by the way, when you go to a website, I've said this before, it's a it's a patchwork quilt of 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 things. There there could be 30 different connections on on any given web page, going to different servers. So if every one of those connections is potentially taking a different route, and <laughs> does that really confuse some of the websites you go to or some applications you use? Do they really get messed up? But but because they're getting all these connections from different IP addresses. Yeah, yeah. Last time, like I think today, when I tried to log into Google, like um, for YouTube, it asked me twice. Uh, I had to sort of like approve, like with the app, and it's showing me a number, and I have to pick a, one of those four. And it actually, sent me multiple emails and asked me, like, "Is this you? Are you sure?" And I never saw this before. Like, check your browser. Does it say account dot HTTPS account dot Google dot? I never saw this before. Oh wow. Yeah, it's it's it is weird. And we actually get sometimes get user requests like, "Why are those those websites in different languages all the time?" And I'm like. That's like, that's the SPN working. I mean, I understand from a user perspective, you're sort of like, if you want to have it in English, you want to see it in English. And sometimes then it's in France and it's in mm. French and in Spanish and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, but that's the SPN working. It's, <laughs> that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you were talking about uh, Cloudflare earlier as well. But from that regard, I sort of see us as the consumer Cloudflare. It's sort of like we're the Mm. opposite to Cloudflare. You know, not that Cloudflare is doing bad stuff. We're using their DNS as the default one in the Portmaster because it's the fastest. We used wanted to use Quad9, but they have been much slower, especially Mm. around the globe. In certain areas, it's faster, but in others, it's very slow. And so uh, we want to see, like, because Cloudflare is sort of like, allowing websites to be everywhere mm-hmm. what we're doing is allowing users to be everywhere you know and so it's it's like the reverse cloudflare and you're right this of course has issues has <laughs> your bank will be calling you much more often and we're trying to build like features which are actually like would reduce privacy of course uh, by bundling those connections but if you know what you're doing if uh, we see like we cannot protect you from yourself that right. much at least <laughs> and if we make it as clear as possible what you're doing that is actually li- like yes it's allowing you to do what you want to do but in a less private way you know and sort of like offering those features explaining it 
and allowing for for you to use your bank again, like without them freaking out too much. <laughs> All right, so let, let's circle back a little bit to, you talked about Tor, you talked about Apple's private relay, you mentioned them on, offhand, and I know that I prompted you that we were going to talk about it. So let's talk about those. Tor, I've talked about before, and it's and it's it's very slow because it does this onion routing thing you've talked about, which I guess you guys do too. So I'm curious to know how you guys do that faster than they do. And then there's Apple's private relay. So explain to us a little bit of what those things are and what problems that is trying to solve. <laughs> so why are we faster? Because we actually pay for quality servers. <laughs> I th like the service and this actually is a thing like when people sign up they're like why are there so little service VPNs usually have thousands of servers and stuff like that and we're like yeah because they sell you on a lot of service what we sell you is on privacy and so what we want is high quality high like capacity servers mm. where lots of people are going through them so that like I, I talked about multiplexing so you're already spreading your connection but if it's mingling with others traffic analysis gets even harder and because the packages like change in size automatically and uh, they're all like doing this traffic analysis is from our point of view possible like uh, we have not heard about anybody who's like who could do stuff like this and of course like never say never and uh, the best encryption given enough resources can be bro uh, can be broken and i think you should always be aware of this but what we're doing is to such a high degree that we feel very confident that if it's not an, a nation state going after you, you should be very private online, mm. like much more private than than with most most other stuff. But you're talking about Tor, and of course, Tor has been built by the U.S. Um, military. Yes, it and, was, <laughs> and it's it's uh, also good technology. And we are like, yes, we are uh, borrowing the idea of onion encryption from them. But I think one of the main differences with Tor is, and you talked about fingerprinting, Tor is usually looked at as the browser or maybe as the brave private tab thingamajig. But it's, mm -hmm. if you don't use Tails or something, you, t you typically don't have your system going through Tor. And so um, when you're in, in an internet cafe or something, as you said earlier, like there are other connections as well. And especially like if you have another browser open as well, like those connections are all not going through through the Tor network. And so, and Tor also has other issues, but I don't actually want to go into those. Mm. Like you can read up on them. Yes. There, Tor is a little bit controversial, like in regards to how, what's, who is running those nodes. Right. What are the intentions? What are they like collecting those nodes and stuff like that? Right. And, and of course, like, because Tor is, is this one route going through and your connections go through that one route and it's not split in between, there is a path to follow. It's easier to follow one string of data mm. and they're doing onion encryption. So it changes packet sizes a little bit as well because one layer of encryption gets removed and stuff, but it's, it's less intentional and it's less, and the, the idea of where the exit actually is, it's not like with us. Uh, targeted at where you actually want to go, you can go somewhere else, and then you have to go through multiple of those ISPs, which we were, were talking about earlier, those high-level ISPs. And so it's it's much less. Um, you are much less in control. It's much less targeted in where it's going and stuff like this. And this is all fine if you are okay with it. Like what Tor offers is Onion, like protected uh, web services as well. Onion websites. We don't offer this. Mm -hmm. Maybe to go into this shortly, um, the reason why we're not doing it is because we are saying like we don't want the question of illegal content. Mm. Through the SPN, there is no darknet. You can only reach services which are on the clear web, but you can reach them in other countries as well. So automatic gay on blocking and stuff. If, it, if there is a country out there that's hosting your content, you will probably be able to reach it. Not a guarantee, though. But what what is it? What we actually want to say, or what we are emphasizing, is if there is no country allowing your content, you should probably not want it as well. You know, mm. sure, sure, <laughs> and sure. This sure. is sort of like how we how we approach this. So we're not protecting ser we're not protecting servers. We're only protecting users. The anti cloud flare, and <laughs> yeah, if that's that's also it. And what Apple Private Relay do? I think it's a very interesting, a very interesting thing there as well. I personally use it as well, but as far as I understand, they are a little bit unclear of what uh, goes through the Apple Private Relay, and so it's mainly Safari. It's right. not all the connections. Right. 
which is a shame. But yeah, maybe maybe eventually they'll re- release it for it. so everything on your OS should go through it. I understand where they're coming from. Yeah, they want us to use Safari, great, but yeah, to really be effective, <laughs> you need to be able to do everything through there. That's true. Yeah, no, and and the other thing, of course, is it's it's two hops. Yes, they have this this connection. So um, with the SPN. You can also say two hops, and we also say, well, then you lose this multiplexing, but it's also from a privacy perspective, good enough most of the time. And so from that point, I cannot say too much <laughs> where I'm like, you should not use it. I don't know what the protocol is. I'd say it's also only one route, but I have not proven mm-hmm. this, but I think it is. It's easier, as you said, like right. in regards to like websites being confused and stuff. It makes, we are creating a sort of new problem because we're doing it and we want to create solutions for the problem we created in sort of a sense. But we think that actually like um, it should be okay how we are doing it in regards to privacy. It's, it's the better way, or at least this is, what, what we feel like. And this is what we're pushing for, of course. <laughs> right. All right. As we wrap up, um, tell me about the roadmap. What does the future look like for you guys? You've, you've, you've alluded to a few things you're working on. I, I know that right now you're only on, uh, uh, you don't support all platforms right now. And I know you want to expand that. So tell where are things go from here. What do you, what is on your roadmap and what is, how far out do we have to wait for these things to come to <laughs> for Mac, for example? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mac, Mac, I'm so sorry. We already started building for Mac before the M1 came out and the, even then back on Intel, they changed how, because we're on the kernel level, they changed how the kernel interfaces mm-hmm. were looking for the stuff we needed. And we're like, okay, this, we need to have much more resources to adapt mm-hmm. to this. And maybe we'll start talking to the people from Little Snitch because they're not too far away from us. So it's interesting that uh, that we're both in Vienna. But yeah, so Android is the next thing. Um, okay. We're on Linux, we're on Windows, and I guess outside of the US, most people with those PCs, like a Linux or a Windows PC, typically have an Android phone. Hmm. So this is what we're targeting and and allowing them, especially, of course, for now, like uh, Portmaster Unlimited, is it's 10 bucks per month. And if it's not on your phone, some people would use a VPN on their phone as well. So hmm. we would be on top of that. Hmm. And we want to sort of like give people the option to to uh, save some money on that on that end and th- the second thing is we have a community discord and <laughs> yeah i know also not the most private stuff mm-hmm. but you have a discord as well i do and and we want to reach people where yeah. they are right. like we we like a matrix channel is for people who already know that they w- want right. privacy we want to get the people who need the privacy the most and so Discord channel, and they actually voted. And um, we're going to do an, a more of like uh, statistics stuff next so that people understand better what actually is like, how many connections are leaving over mm. a given period of time mm-hmm. and so on. Because Portmaster currently does not show you the stats what Brave typically show you, you know, mm. and it's just nice numbers going up. You you mm-hmm. have a, a this warm feeling of being more private and right, stuff. Yeah. And so... Giving this and also it's a great opportunity for people to then share and, and and show others. I have so many connections. The question you have been asking, like how many un, uh, unprotected connections are there? People want to know that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't because I <sighs> block the stuff anyway, but <laughs> I understand the question. People are curious. And so I guess this is how we can get people into more privacy, like uh, show them what they're actually like what's going on and then they can start their privacy journey and maybe download signal and maybe i don't know <laughs> yeah actually start taking the privacy serious <laughs> yeah oh yeah well rafael this was awesome fantastic conversation i really enjoyed learning about this stuff you guys are doing some great work i wish you all the best because we need more products like this so uh thanks so much for coming on the show thank you for having me That was a lot of fun. Rafi and I had a lot of good time talking both before and after the interview. I got some great bonus content, like almost another 30 minutes, I think, of talking with Rafael about some of this stuff where we get a little bit more technical. I also got his origin story, how he got into this and how the safing products have kind of evolved and what their roadmap looks like. So there's a lot of bonus content for my patrons coming up on Thursday. So there's some good stuff in the show notes. He talked about the Naomi Brockwell uh, VPN video. That is well done and very informative talking about the quote unquote dark side of VPNs. There's a link in the show notes for that and everything else I'm about to tell you. You can, of course, go to safing.io 
and check out their free Partmaster product, which is currently only available for Windows and Linux and hopefully soon on Android and learn more about their SPN, including a link to the white paper they wrote a few years back. The name changed, but they're talking about their SPN. He mentioned the Tails operating system. That is a Linux-based operating system that is built around privacy. And we talked about the OSI layer model. That's getting pretty darn technical. But if for some reason you're curious about how that works, there's a link in the show notes for that as well. All right, that is going to wrap it up for today. I hope everyone's having a great holiday season and relaxing and spending some time with friends and family. This is a great time to recharge and just take a break. Don't let the opportunity pass you by. Next week, we'll be looking ahead to 2023. I've got some tips for you and we'll catch up on all the news. There's been plenty of it. We'll catch up on all the news that has happened over this holiday break. Have a wonderful rest of your holiday season and a very happy new year. And I will see you again next week. Till then, as always, stay safe out there and don't get caught with your drawbridge down. (laughs) 